This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. No, I'm not that Christian Bryant who played football at Ohio State. That dude stay messing up my search results when I'm Googling myself. Anyway, here's what we got for y'all. Making the Olympics is a dream for many athletes. With the Tokyo Games just a month away, we'll introduce you to one competitor who despite hardships, will get a chance to represent his country as a refugee on the world stage. And after a pause in donations, companies are again giving to GOP members of Congress who voted against certifying the 2020 presidential election. But first, here's what you need to know right now. 2020 was a historically awful year for gun violence, and so far, 2021 is looking even worse. Because of this, and because gun violence typically increases during the summer months, the Biden administration is putting forward a plan and funding to support it. Community policing and programs that keep neighborhoods safe and keep folks out of trouble. These efforts work, they save lives. The White House calls its five-part plan a comprehensive strategy to prevent and respond to gun crimes. Here's what's in it. The plan would support law enforcement so they can address the predicted summer spike in violent crime, invest in community violence interventions, and support teens and young adults through summer programming, job opportunities, and additional services, among other things. State and local governments can start allocating the $350 billion in federal funds from the American Rescue Plan to assist law enforcement and bolster community violence interventions right away. As we've reported before, cities across the country are seeing a significant spike in violence. In some places, that's erased recent years of progress to stem gun violence specifically. This announcement comes as the DOJ launches its own initiative to stop illegal gun trafficking. The name is a little intense, but the DOJ will create five firearms trafficking strike forces to focus on major gun trafficking corridors. You're likely gonna hear a lot more about voting rights this year, even after a major reform effort failed yesterday. In an unsurprising move, the For the People Act is now, for all intents and purposes, dead after it failed to get the needed votes to advance. The bill was the Democratic response to voting restrictions passed by Republican-led state legislatures. Now, Democrats are eyeing another bill as their next move. The President and I are very clear. We support S-1. We support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And the fight is not over. This alternative proposal, supported by Senator Joe Manchin, has some of the same provisions as the For the People Act, like expanding early voting and making Election Day a holiday. We are officially one month out from the opening night of the 2021 Summer Olympics. The ceremony typically looks a little something like this. A crowded stadium full of fans as the thousands of athletes from around the world get introduced. But that probably won't be the case come next month. Host cities are designated years in advance, so nobody could have predicted this current predicament. And I think it's safe to say Tokyo drew the short straw here. According to the University of Oxford, these are the most expensive games on record. The official cost is 15.4 billion US dollars, but several government audits say it could be twice that amount. And it's not like Tokyo will be able to recover much of that money spent. Typically, the summer games draw hundreds of thousands of tourists, but international spectators have already been banned from the Tokyo games. Venues can still host local fans, but only up to 50% capacity. They must wear masks, social distance, and here's the kicker, refrain from cheering. The sale and consumption of alcohol has also been banned at Olympic venues and the Olympic Village, in part to prevent the spread of infections. So basically, if an athlete wants to celebrate a win with a drink, they are being asked to do so alone in their room. As one article put it, Tokyo is shaping up to be a no fun Olympics. Though to keep in mind, a lot of these rules were put in place because of Japan's public opposition to hosting the games amid a pandemic that's still very much a threat there. Right now, just 7% of Japan's population has been fully vaccinated against the virus. Now that we've covered some of the hurdles leading up to the games, we could use an inspirational story, right? I don't think the year-long postponement of the games hit anyone as hard as the athletes who have dedicated their lives to training for an opportunity like this. Newsy's Ben Shimiso introduces us to one of those athletes who is a member of the Olympic refugee team. This fella tells us what it took for him to get a chance to play in the global spotlight. 
When Syrian badminton player Aram Mahmoud fled his home country six years ago, he left everything behind, including his family. It was a very difficult decision for my, for, for my family, for my father and mother, and for me also. But he knew it was the only way to pursue his dream of playing badminton at the highest level. When I left Syria and went to the Netherlands, I found a safe place. After that, I start also playing the, the sport I love. His dream will come true this summer in Tokyo. Refugee Olympic team! Mahmoud is one of 29 refugee athletes selected to compete at the Olympic Games under the Olympic flag. The team includes a wrestler from Iraq, a cyclist from Afghanistan, and a runner from South Sudan. He got selected to play for the first time at the Olympics. I mean, it's huge opportunity for you. How do you feel about it? When they announced, announced my name, that I was in a team, that I was going to the Olympics, was like one of my best moments in my life, actually. The Olympic refugee team, which first competed five years ago in Rio, is meant to send a message of solidarity, resilience and hope at a time when a record number of people are fleeing war and persecution around the globe. I'm very proud, actually, to be able to represent millions of people, to make them feel that they, they can also reach their goal if they believe in, them, in their self. Mahmoud fled Syria alone when he was a teenager amid a civil war. The conflict, which started 10 years ago, has left 500,000 people dead and 13 million displaced. When he arrived in the Netherlands in 2015, Mahmoud struggled to prove himself. When I was in Syria, I couldn't practice, so my level was um, like a bit down. Due to his refugee status, he was unable to compete internationally for the next three years. But since then, he's wasted no time climbing the world rankings. And now I am like number two or three in the Netherlands, so uh, it's, it's like twice, quite a big improvement. Though he's far from a favorite, Mahmoud is ready to make the most of his time in Tokyo. It's a very huge for me, for my family, for my father. They know that I like, I deserve this kind of chances, and uh, I uh, like, I will also do my best there. I'm not just going there to participate. Ben Chamiso, Newsy. Just remember, no matter how easy these Olympic athletes make it seem, they will absolutely mop the floor with most of us in their event. More companies are warming up to lawmakers again who fought the result of the 2020 election on January 6th. Newsy's Patrick Terpstra looked through campaign finance records and discovered the self-imposed corporate freeze on political spending is beginning to thaw. UPS is delivering more than packages to Capitol Hill. New campaign finance records show UPS giving to lawmakers who voted against certifying the election. The donations come after UPS paused political spending in the days following the January 6th insurrection. Many of those companies just pulled away. Washington's burning down. Let's, let, let's, not, let, let's not give any more fuel to it at least initially. Rice University professor Douglas Schuler says companies froze campaign donations to avoid heat for funding people who promoted the baseless idea that President Biden didn't actually win the election. A lot of people started asking, like, who's behind those members of Congress? We reviewed recent filings of the Federal Election Commission and found 16 corporations sending money to Congress again, including to some of the 147 Republican election objectors. The list includes Ford, General Motors, Lockheed Martin, JetBlue. Like UPS, they're companies that announced at least a temporary stop in contributions to all lawmakers after the Capitol riot. Those few weeks after the event, I think a lot of companies just said, look, we don't want to be a part of it. We're above this. The donations come from employee-sponsored political action committees, PACs for short. UPS reported giving to two Republican election dissenters and a flurry of new PAC donations that also went to Democrats. UPS never said why they stopped donating after the insurrection and did not respond to questions about why the PAC chose to support election opponents. 
Boeing took a time out to review political spending to ensure that we support those who not only support our company, but also uphold our country's most fundamental principles. Now, a new FEC filing shows Boeing's PAC spending again to Democrats and Republicans, including four who challenged the election. We asked Boeing who would the company not support anymore after its review. Thanks for the question, a Boeing spokesman responded, but nothing additional to add beyond the statement that said, we will continue to carefully evaluate our giving. The corporation Cigna is a special case. The health insurer said it would no longer donate specifically to lawmakers who encouraged or supported violence or who, quote, otherwise hindered the peaceful transition of power. But FEC filings show two months later, Cigna donated to seven members of Congress who tried to prevent certifying the election. Please raise your right hand. When we asked Cigna about those donations, they referred us to a company statement that said, in their view, voting against the election was not an act of obstructing a peaceful transition of power. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. The FEC records show the company's still not giving to some of the most vocal election skeptics. Holly with his fist, right? That was like a very like powerful symbol. There might be a little bit more attention on donations to those people. Duke Energy, one of the nation's largest electric companies, back to contributing to a number of home state representatives. But not to Madison Cawthorn, who the PAC previously backed. The congressman spoke to the crowd of Trump supporters just before the Capitol attack. Our Constitution was violated! The FEC records show some companies are slowly returning to the long tradition of donating to both parties, focusing on congressional leaders and committee chairpersons, those most able to shape policies the corporations care about. It's a practice Duke Energy CEO defended at a recent shareholders meeting. We must be a part of the conversation so that we can bring our subject matter expertise, our experience, the needs of our customers to the table, and we'll continue to do that. Even as many other company PACs still aren't opening their wallets to those who fought the election result. Patrick Terpstra, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, we'll tell you how one Pacific Northwest community turned pandemic hardships into a way to help the homeless. As COVID-19 worsened throughout 2020, so did homelessness. National reporter Jesse Cohen tells us about one county in Seattle, Washington, that took this opportunity to permanently get people off the streets. In many parts of the country, this is a familiar sight. Oh, we make all kinds of assumptions about people who are living in homelessness. Uh, and I think some of the worst are that this is a choice. Claudia Balducci, the chair of the King County Council in Seattle, says COVID-19 changed the city's response to homelessness. People realized pretty quickly that we couldn't continue to house folks in homelessness in these big congregate shelters where they were sleeping on mats on the floor or bunk beds in a big open room because it was just dangerous. There was too much risk of transmission of the virus. COVID also left some local hotels empty, so the county leased them, allowing them to offer homeless people a private room. So we knew we were on to something. Dow Constantine, the King County executive, says the evidence was right in front of them. The difference between having a safe place to sleep and then being pushed out on the street and having your own room with lock on the door, however modest, was uh, dramatic. The answer to homelessness is housing. In 2020, the Washington legislature gave them the authority to raise the sales tax to accelerate getting people into housing. The pandemic, combined with this opportunity, led the county to purchase its first hotel, the Inn at Queen Anne. And have about five more hotels that are in some stage of negotiation and we'll keep buying more. They say this is the drastic change they've been looking for to combat homelessness. And we found that people felt safer, they felt calmer, they did better with their mental health, they did better with planning for the future, there were fewer incidents, less conflict. They got direct feedback about what these rooms meant to people experiencing homelessness. I have a door I can close, I feel safe, I can sleep. Uh, there's a place for me to store my belongings. I don't need to carry things around with me or worry about them being stolen all the time. And then they can focus on utilizing resources. Instead of being in crisis mode all the time, you can't plan for your future when you're 
constantly dealing with the crisis of the moment. According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, on a single night in 2020, roughly 580,000 people experienced homelessness in the United States. I think that this is an opportunity for every community that's experiencing homelessness. King County wants to be a model for the rest of the country. They say spending money on the front end instead of the back end can create results. If you're a taxpayer, you're paying for that because people end up in hospitals, they end up in jails, very expensive services that all taxpayers contribute to on the far end of, of the emergency spectrum. Over time, you're going to save money because you'll have a lot less of that emergency intervention that is so expensive and frankly doesn't solve the problem. They expect to have about 1,600 people off of the streets and into permanent housing by the end of next year. A reality they feel will drastically change their community. We're going to show the public that this works, and by doing so, I believe we will build support to do more of it until we have finally turned the tide on this crisis. In Seattle, Washington, I'm Jesse Cohen reporting. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. If you're feeling really lazy, send me a voice note, unless you are a bot. Don't nobody want to listen to binary code. The pandemic exposed a lot of issues, including problems with the food supply chain. Those affected the most by that are also some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. National reporter Maya Rodriguez tells us how one program looked to the ocean to find a way to help those who are in need. On an early sunny morning, A fresh catch comes ashore. We deal with crabs, oysters, shrimp, fish. A new shrimp season just opened along Mississippi's coast, and Jeremy Fort of Jerry Fort Seafood couldn't be busy. It's always keeping you guessing, you know, that's for sure. But that wasn't necessarily the case during the pandemic. When restaurants shut down, it created a chain reaction for fishermen around the country. We're highly dependent on the restaurant sales. And, uh, you know, certainly when you saw these massive shutdowns of the restaurants, it caused a lot of uncertainty, a lot of disruption to the supply chain. At the same time, just down the road from the harbor, soup kitchens and food pantries reeled from the economic strain of COVID. We're having a 30 to 50 percent request uh, increase in requests for food. Um, many people were first time patrons of food pantries and soup kitchens. And that's when the harbor met the soup kitchen. Brought together by the nonprofit Catch Together. Founder Paul Parker. What we realized is not just uh, the food insecurity crisis was deepening in terms of the number of people they needed to serve, but also many of the sources of their traditional proteins was, was drying up because restaurants and uh, restaurants were closed, which is one source. And then also a lot of supermarkets were just sold out. Through grants, Catch Together provided funding for food pantries and soup kitchens to buy fresh local seafood from fishermen in coastal communities across the country. That kept fishermen working and people in need fed from Maine to Massachusetts to Florida to Mississippi to Alaska and beyond. They're now looking to expand the program, seeking additional funding from state agencies and the USDA. It really gave fishermen an opportunity to participate in solving a problem, working together to solve a problem that was really bigger than any one person. Extra Table got $30,000 to help get fresh seafood into local food banks and soup kitchens like this one. It's a beautiful uh, partnership across the nation, quite literally. If it weren't for Catch Together, we would have never been able to put two and two together. Back at the harbor. I'm willing to do whatever I can do to, to help the community out. The catch keeps coming in. It's been a, a, a real big boost. It was really a win-win. On both land and the sea. In Pass Christiane, Mississippi, I'm Maya Rodriguez. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop, same time, same place. Top stories from news are headed your way right now.